I'm driving along the road less traveled and suddenly a truck covered in mud comes barreling down on me. I look to my right and see a burly white guy. He's dressed in camouflage and he's peering at me like a predator about to pounce on its prey. My low fuel light begins to flash. As I'm stuck between fight and flight, he smiles, throws up a peace sign, and speeds away. Amongst the rubble and the dust, I see his back bumper, and there's a sticker that reads, a racism. Eracism. I know what you're thinking. Is this yet another talk on race? Yes, but this talk will proceed where others end. I founded Brother Jeff's Cultural Center in 1995. It's located in historic Five Points in Denver, Colorado. I have facilitated countless talks and workshops on race. I'm going to share with you how to arrive at that noble destination, eracism, in four steps, awareness, observation, conversation, and action. The first step is awareness. And I have a question. What is racism? Ask 100 people that question and you'll get 200 answers. Some use race and racism synonymously, but they're different. For example, most people in the United States identify in terms of race. That's not a problem. The problem is racism. I define racism as the evil twin of race or the shadow side of race. Race is a relatively new concept and was conceived in 1795 by Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Blumenbach was a German physician, and he had the notion to collect skulls and rank them in order of beauty. Skulls like his, he termed Caucasian or white. Skulls like mine, Ethiopian or black. He had Mongolian yellow, Malayan brown, and American red, referring to the indigenous people of this land. At this point in my talk, someone's invariably going to say, aha, race is a social construct. And it is. But before I sign off on your continuing education credits, I have another question. Aren't most, if not all, human social interactions social constructs? Time and money come to mind. In fact, building social constructs is what humans do. It's like our gig. Awareness is important, but it won't lead us to our goal of eracism. The second step is observation. Close your eyes and observe when race first came online for you? Did race show up alone? Or was race accompanied by its evil twin, racism? Now open your eyes and think about what you observed. For me, race showed up alone. I was raised in the wake of the Black Power Movement where James Brown said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Cassius Clay became Muhammad Ali and Negroes turned black. My blackness has always been the source of deep pride. Sadly, for others, blackness is a badge of inferiority and shame. The latter is due to racism. When did you first observe racism? I first observed racism in 1977 while watching Roots. 
It was a television miniseries that aired for an entire week. I'll never forget seeing Kunta Kinte being strung up a tree and brutally whipped until he accepted the name Toby. I would later learn that names and naming are very important, but that's a different talk. I also observed racism when I traveled to Ferguson, Missouri. This was in the wake of a black man by the name of Michael Brown being shot and killed by a white police officer. The city went up in flames, literally. State Senator Rhonda Fields asked me to facilitate conversations based on deteriorating relationships between the black community and law enforcement. In heated situations like this, there's a natural inclination to make conversation the first step, but that never works, never. What works is time, space, and pre-established relationships. As you can imagine, those early sessions were filled with venting and little conversation. That's normal. When the venting subsided and the conversations began, I was struck by the focus on guns. Growing up in an inner city, guns have always been negative and attached to hurt, maiming, and killing. Through conversation, I learned that there are those who have positive relationships with guns. I remember a sheriff talking about guns used in sport and him bonding with his father while hunting as a child. That never crossed my mind. In fact, my opening story is based on that conversation. From one perspective, you see a burly white guy in camouflage as a racist. From another perspective, a sportsman in the moment of celebration after sacking a deer. Conversations in the right order can lead to positive outcomes as is the case with the black community, law enforcement, and legislators. We were able to agree on bipartisan legislation that was signed into law. That's an example of the last step, action. While traveling to the United States from Ethiopia on Ethiopian Airlines, passengers included Ethiopians, Sudanese, Congolese, Kenyans, there were Germans, French, Spanish, and others. We even had a layover in Ireland, and many Irish boarded the plane. The moment we landed in Washington, D.C., and those passengers, no matter how complex their identity, exited the front door, they were reduced to white, black, or a person of color. That's how race works in the United States. That's not how race works in other countries. While I was studying in South Africa, I was shocked to learn that blacks and coloreds are not the same. The apartheid government would arbitrarily determine race by seeing if a pencil would remain stuck in your hair or fall through. Strange, but true. I remember talking with a man who grew up white. He showed me his identification card was changed to black after he married a black woman. In the United States, I was looking for some windows and Raul from South America was my salesman. When I introduced myself as brother Jeff, he got real solemn and ask the same question that many of you have. Are you a minister? No, I said, brother means black. Raul replied, why is racism such a big deal in the United States? Racism is a big deal in the United States, but it doesn't have to be. At the start of this talk, I promise to offer you four steps to erase racism. 
awareness, observation, conversation, and action. Remember the passengers that landed in Washington, D.C.? If you want to erase racism, do not exit through the metaphorical front door. There's another exit, the one with the added leg room and the extra responsibility. It's the door where you're in charge, the side door. But before you take action and swing it open, ask yourself, what benefits and costs are associated with the door you choose? This talk may seem like an oversimplification, and it is, because race and its evil twin racism are simple. Prior to race, people identified by nation. Prior to nation, religion. Before religion, I would imagine who stored the most grain. Eracism is simple. In fact, we can follow the lead of the very first anti-racist. His name is Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Blumenbach would later discover that his theories on race were unfounded and exited through the side door. If he can do it, so can you. Which door will you choose? Thank you. Or as my friend Raul would say, muchas gracias. Thank <laughs> you.